Welcome to this episode where I am joined by Emily Simpson. Now, Emily is a mum of three. She had twins and then when they just turned three, she had another one. Um, So almost three under three. She certainly knows what it's like to have her hands full. And Emily is also one of our certified partners at The Sleep Nanny. So Emily, welcome to the show. Hello. (laughs) Hi. Tell us a little bit more just about you and 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 what brought you to this stage in the journey as a mum and an expert in sleep yeah so we um initially found out we were having twins when I was around seven weeks pregnant and my husband was actually abroad um at a wedding in Italy at this time so um I found out on my own my dad was with me but um yeah sort of not in the the scan room so I had to phone him and FaceTime him to tell him that we were having twins um, which obviously came as a bit of a shock to him. So yeah, I was really excited, but also very nervous. Uh, the first thing was I Google sort of how you how do you breastfeed two babies, how um, you know how big you get during your pregnancies, all the, all those sort of I think worries that most twin mums probably have at that sort of initial stage. How you're going to cope with feeding two, how the sleeping is going to be. So yeah, there was a lot of um, sort of excitement, but also. Um, yeah, I guess a bit scared about it and how I, how we were going to cope with with two babies. So um, pregnancy all went fine. Um, I had non-identical twins, so they um, had their own Saxon placenta, so we were quite lucky that everything was straightforward for us. Um, we were in hospital for about four days before we came home with them. And then, yeah, we really struggled with the sleep. So they, um, I was initially breastfeeding, um breastfeeding them but that was really hard you know we were at some nights we were getting 20 30 minutes sleep a night and that was it because they wow. were just, yeah continually uh breastfeed you'd breastfeed one it could take you know four to five minutes an hour to breastfeed them put them down and the other one's awake so mm-hmm. that was really challenging on um both of us really because my husband would also be up and dealing with the other one or burping one um so after two weeks of that um, with my husband going back to work, we decided that, um, yeah, I couldn't, we couldn't continue like that. So we then went into formula feeding um, at night time. So we um, would each take a baby, feed the baby, burp them and put them back down. So if one baby wake, we'd wake the other one. And that was, that completely changed everything for us. So um, yeah, made things a lot easier. And I would also pump at those times of bottle feeding them. So then in the day, um, it just made it easier. I would breastfeed one and bottle feed the other one with express breast milk. Then the next feed, I'd swap them round. So trying to, um, yeah, sort of combi feed a bit, really, because I find it quite difficult, um, the sort of feeding them both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, so it was all, I think those first six weeks for us, we found, yeah, really hard. We were exhausted. We couldn't find time to cook ourselves dinner or anything. So we were very lucky. We had family bringing food round. If friends yeah. came to visit, we would give them a baby each and we're like, we're just going to go and get 20 minutes sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Good plan. Yeah, doing anything we could to get a little sleep in. And then uh, we started a routine around six weeks. And this is what initially stemmed my interest in becoming a sleep consultant. So I did mm-hmm. loads of research. And we started being sort of quite strict with it. They were going to sleep at the same time, waking up at the same time, being fed at the same time. And that for me was just such a game changer. Up to that point, I had really struggled. And then I sort of, I knew at what times I could go out, go to baby classes and things like that, because I knew that I wouldn't be stuck in a situation where one of them was going to need to um, sort of get to sleep or to be fed or anything like that. So that structure for me worked really well. Mm. Mm. And since then, um, we've always kept to it. So even now, at four years old, they're sort of in the bath, six o'clock, you know, we're very regimented, they're down asleep by seven o'clock every single night. Yeah. Um, So yeah, I think some people thought we were completely crazy because we were so strict with this routine. But for my mental health, and for the boys as well, they were so happy and content. That was, um, yeah, the best thing that we ever chose to do, really. And it's going to ask yeah, sorry. about that, about them, like, yeah, and how they, how it affected them. Because actually, like you say, you needed that structure. That structure was a sanity saver for you mm. and, and for your sleep. Um, but actually, they thrive too. And it yeah. really helps them as well, right? 
yeah really and they were just they were so happy and content and we always we were always people always come to say oh they're so content and I, mm. I genuinely believe it's because they were getting the sleep that they needed and yes they still woke up at night you know it's not that yeah they were sleeping through it was just that they had those structured sleeps they had nap times um, and for me as well, it meant that during the day, I knew what time the naps were. So in the morning, I would, um, once they'd gone down for the nap, I would whiz, whiz around the house, sort out their bottles, clean everything from the night before, you know, sort of get on top of things. I'd get ready, I'd get all the stuff in the car ready because we'd be going out to you know, meet friends or to play date, or whatever we were doing. Um, and then I'd get back for their lunchtime nap as well. So then I knew that I'd have good sort of two hours really over lunch to get yeah. food prepared. And yeah, so for me, it just made a huge difference. And they were, yeah, they've always been great with sort of going down at nap time and everything because we did it from an early age. Yeah. They yeah knew those cues. We did bedtime routine from six weeks. Um, so yeah, for us, that worked really, really well. And it sounds like you said, like when you found out you were having twins, you Googled everything, you Mm -hmm. tried to get like in the know as much as you could, but it sounds like nothing, almost nothing could prepare you for Mm. the reality of actual juggle of, like you said, well, how do I feed two? And you can can read things, but until you're doing it, it's, it's probably quite different. And so, I mean, how do, how do people prepare for that if, you know if it's almost like until you're in that situation situation. you can't yeah yeah I think like you said just sort of reading up and understanding a bit about how to keep them on the same routine so um sort of understanding a bit about their weight winners because in a way it's almost an advantage having twins to having them at different sort of stages because they're they've got the same sort of sleep needs at the same times so, you know, if you can be regimented and be feeding them at the same time, getting sleep at the same time, naturally they're at the same age. So that's, you know, sort of, yeah, uh, age related is is right for them. Yeah. Yeah. So I think sort of getting that basis and the understanding of sleep. So mm. um, and that's what I think we did. But six weeks in before that, when we'd always said, you know, our one thing that we want to get right is sleep, because both my husband and I love our sleep and both really struggle without it. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think that when it, having that support as well, my husband was really on board with it. He actually took a day off. The first day we started the routine, he was like, I'm going to take day off work. We're going to do this. We're going to, you know, get them down, settle them to sleep at the same time, wake them up at the same time. And that for me was like, I think I would really struggled to do it on my own because you're exhausted. Like they yeah. wake up at different times in the night It's and it's hard. Like those, yeah. you know, I think even with one baby, but with two, it can be really tough. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think... I think for us as well, getting prepared, making sure you've got a changing station downstairs. So you've got the vest, the baby grows, everything downstairs as well. So we had a whole, we actually bought a changing table just to put in our living room um, for those first six months. So you're not constantly running up and down. Mm. Um, Sort of being prepared with things like that. Having bouncers, so we'd have a bouncer upstairs, bouncer downstairs. So if I'm dealing with one, you know, you can mm. put the other one in the bouncer. You can bounce with your foot whilst you're changing. That's you know what I mean. Just so that you've got yeah. those, you've got those aids there for you. Or if you're doing bath time on your own, um, especially when they're really small, I'd have one in the, in a bouncer next to me in the bathroom and one in the bath, and then yeah, sort of change and swap over. So thinking yeah. about those, um, anything that can be helpful for you at those those beginning um, couple of months, I guess. Yeah, and, definitely. Um. I was going to say sort of preparing food wise I know that sounds like uh it's not really something you'd probably think about but we really struggled with cooking our dinners because we were just we had a baby each constantly you know when they're they're newborns they want to be held Mm. so sort of getting a freezer stash cooking loads of stuff in the freezer so you can just get it out or asking people when they come around can you bring us a meal you know that people won't mind and you think people Mm. like to help just almost sort of accepting that help and relying on other people a bit to to help out in those times I think it's one of the best gifts isn't it that oh, you can yeah. take for a new family a new mum a new you know new parents is yeah. here yeah. here's a cottage pie to last for a week yeah. <laughs> healthy snack bars my mum used to bring I used to yeah. um when I was breastfeeding them both through the night I'd be starving so I'd have some sort of snack bars with those and nuts and things like that into yeah snack on in the night <laughs> That's so helpful, definitely. So 
when you now, so you, this, this, this whole experience um, led you to that fascination with sleep and, yeah. and what works and how that works. Um, and then you did it all again when they were just over three with, yeah. with um, third baby. Um, what do you feel you see, you know, obviously you have lots of parents come to you for help specifically with twins because they know you're the person that not just has the expertise like I do but you've got the experience as well firsthand Mm -hmm. um and you know they they know you understand and you know they you understand them what do you feel that they most commonly ask or you know the sticking points that they're like that they struggle with most the the concern of one baby waking the other one so that's that's a big thing and how to get them onto the same routine so mm. I think with twins, what happens quite a lot is you rush to them because you hear a slight noise at night and you think, I'm going to get one. We used to do this. Get to them as yeah. quickly as you can because you don't want to risk waking the other baby. And then you've got two babies awake that are then going to be sort of needed to resettle. So I'd say that's probably the main one is that um, sort of how to deal with that, with them waking each other. Mm. And um, that is something, it's part of the learning, learning process. A lot of twins share um sort of even cots at the beginning of stages but share rooms so it's uh, it is sort of a part of a learning process and they do learn to just sleep through each other and there will mm. be sort of phases where you'll find they're waking each other up but um sort of when they've moved into their own bedroom the ideal setup is to try and have the cots you know on opposite sides of the wall so that they're not right next to each other and a white noise machine in between so that can really help sort of drowning that noise out a little bit and reduce the risk of them waking each other Mm. Um, yeah and it will they do they get used to it you know my boys now um they you know most of the time they're great sleepers on the other night if one of them does wake the other one black out they don't even sort of move an inch in their sleep so yeah it's a sort of learning process of getting used to each other's noises yeah and um the other one is get getting them onto that same routine so that can be tough especially you know, if they're old and they haven't been on that same routine, sort of trying to develop that. So sort of uh, making sure they're waking at similar times, that they're feeding at the same time, going down to bed at the same time. Um, and that's such a huge thing with twins, because otherwise mm-hmm. you've got them waking, especially when they're sort of tiny, waking at separate times at the night, you know, and sometimes when they're newborn, it can take an hour to feed them, can't yeah. it, to feed, burp and then resettle them. By the time you've done that, you could have, you know, 40 minutes until the next one's due to be awake. If you're lucky. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's getting them um, getting into that routine of, um, especially when they're tiny, waking the other one to feed them. Um, and there will be some cases where um, there's one twin that's a much lower birth weight. So in that case, they might need more feeds. Mm-hmm. So there are sort of some exceptions to that. But on the whole, if they're on the same sort of... Um, point of feeding and how much they're taking and everything yeah waking one when the other one's woken um and I'd keep that going until you've weaned off night feeding so So yeah uh, that's definitely one of those things that seems counterintuitive doesn't it like yeah that one's sleeping let them sleep but actually waking and and syncing them up is gonna have the longer term benefit yeah absolutely yeah do you find, um, I, I have found over the years, whenever I've worked with families with twins, mm. in my experience, they've always come to me with um, one twin that is particularly challenging with sleep and the yeah. other that's actually quite a good sleeper. Um, I think I've only maybe once or twice had situations where both twins are a challenge. But mm. usually, especially if they're baby twins rather than toddler twins, um, it, it's a case that you know there's the good sleeper and and the not so yeah. good sleeper. Do you I find mean, that quite yeah. common? Mm. Yeah, with every family I've worked with, that's the case. There's usually one that finds sleep a lot easier. They can settle themselves easier, um, and I also find quite often they almost will sort of look over to the other one who's kicking up a fuss, doesn't want to go to sleep, and almost just sort of roll over and think, oh, and just go to sleep. Um, yeah. yeah, and I I've got quite a lot of mum, twin mum friends and. My twins were certainly the same. There's always been one that's, um, even from newborn, he was a lot more relaxed. You'd lay him down and he'd just go to sleep. And the other one, um, my other little one, found it a lot harder. Mm. Yeah, so that's really common. And and I think that's also sort of um, linked into personality quite a bit. You quite often have 
a more laid back twin and then a more sort of alert twin. Mm. Usually the alert twin that finds it a bit harder um, sort of to settle themselves to sleep and sort of switch off, I guess, at nap times and things. The laid back twin's probably the one that's, you know, it's like, I've got your back, it's fine. I'll, I'm yeah. going to just relax over here because I know that you need this extra help. Oh, yeah. I do remember, I remember working with a family that there were two sets of twins and a single oh, child. Yeah. All, uh, gosh, I think they were all under 10. Yeah. Um, if this is going back a long time now. But the the juggle is real. And ev- even in that situation, it was a case of identifying, okay, who is actually okay here? And who do we really need to support with their sleep? Um, mm. They weren't babies. So it was you know, a little easier to, to, to you know, make those identifications and then work to their personality needs. But I imagine that if we're talking about, you know, baby twins, um, even from newborn or, or sort of six months or that sort of age in that first mm-hmm. year. And you're still learning their personalities, you know, you're still trying to get to grips with the different cries and yeah. what their needs are. Um, would you, how do you know, this is what I'm, where I'm going with this, is like, how do you know which twin mm. um, that um, to, to kind of, get onto their routine or rhythm or you yeah. know when we said about wake one um yeah. to fit with the other would you wake a good sleeper to fit a bad sleeper's frequent wakings every time they work or would you be like this one's good right now we want this one to fit with this one like yeah how do you yeah how do so you figure it out? I'd say certainly with my twins it was it was quite clear from the offset with that we had one that was um even his sort of his how his body was, he was very floppy and relaxed, and the other one was yeah. almost quite uptight and straight, like you told him, and he'd be really rigid and straight. Mm. Um, so it was quite clear from the offset with, with them. And um, so the one that um, found sleep a bit harder, he would take longer to settle, and actually my husband could settle him easier than what I could. He could. It was mm. a lot quicker for my husband to settle him. Um, whereas the other one, from a really young age, you could just pop him, pop him in the cot and he'd just go to sleep. No. Um, so that was very obvious from the beginning and we did get to the point where um, it was maybe maybe three months four months in when we actually stopped waking the one that was a better sleeper because we thought actually I think he can go much longer um, so we did get to that point where we were then feeding one in the night and the other one would go for longer stretches so I think yeah as a mum, you sort of get to know that and you think, yeah. actually, I'm waking him and he's not, he's not really hungry. So, you know, you don't want to be waking and feeding them if they're not at that point and they're not hungry. Yeah. And I think also you um, sort of judging by their daytime feeds, you know, how long they can go in between feeds during the day. So if one of them is waking up, you know, if they go three to four hours throughout the day between feeds and then one's waking up two hours of going down, then I'd be looking to, yeah, sort of resettle rather than waking the other one um, yeah. and trying to resettle that one without a feed because you think that, you know, the chances are it isn't actually because he's hungry, he's just waking yeah. he needs help to resettle. Um, so it's a bit like then holding one to the other one's standards, isn't it? Like, okay, yeah. we know that, they, you know, particularly if you know that they are similar in terms of developmental stage and Mm -hmm. um, capacity size and so on yeah so if one can do it you're like okay I know that the other one can it's just Mm. about um, helping them along and showing them the way so it's like yeah Yeah. that makes sense and I found as well when they were um, when we moved them from cots and into beds um, which I hadn't done my um, sort of my sleep consulting training at, at that point so I wish I had because it would have gone a bit smoother <laughs> um, and we had one that would just repeatedly get out of his bed sort of it could be 40 50 60 times at bedtime so nighttime he was fine he'd sleep in through the night but it was like that initial bedtime yeah. and the other twin would lay on his front like this watching kicking his legs as if he was watching a tv show what and he'd be like saying mummy he's out of bed again <laughs> so it was that sort of yeah you quite often got the one that's um yeah mine especially I've got one that always tells on the other one and the other one is just doing whatever he likes to do really (laughs) oh (laughs) so talk to us a bit Emily about um whether or not you would and when you would keep your twins together or 
separate in terms of their sleeping arrangements that could be yeah. the same sleep space the same room um what, what are the kind of fors and against with separating them for sleeps yeah so a lot of that I think is personal preference mm-hmm. so at the beginning I know a lot of people you will, will keep them together at the beginning um so there's a really good uh, fact sheet on the lullaby trust website specifically for twin sleep so they advise never to let twins share a Moses basket. So because they're quite small, um, and even if they're, you know, even if your twins are very small, the Moses baskets, I think they, it's due to risk of overheating. So with Moses mm-hmm. baskets, always separate Moses baskets, but those next to me cribs, mm-hmm. um, safest way is foot to foot. So you have sort of the baby's head in the middle and then their feet at the end um, until they get too big to do that. And I think it's always advisable, to, especially when they start rolling, to then put them into separate cots, um, just because, yeah, babies can be quite active. And when you've got two in there, if they're sort of rolling over, especially if they've got sleeping bags on and things like that, just from a safety, yeah. deep safety aspect, um, yeah, mm. it's advisable to put them into separate cots. Um, I suppose much like the like why you wouldn't put a teddy bear in exactly. or, a, you know, any anything else in with a baby on their own it's like yeah that, at that point the Thinking twin being in there with them is like exactly that thing yeah yeah um so yeah and I'd yeah definitely check out the lullaby trust fact sheet because there's loads of good information on that um the other thing yeah. with moving into their bedrooms I guess a lot of that is personal choice and probably governed by whether you've got two spare rooms um we did have a spare room mm. but we chose to keep them together because uh, we thought um, the likelihood we probably would have one more child so we didn't want to separate them and then have to go through the process of um, sort of get them to work out to sleep back in that same room again yeah so yeah. If they are in the same room um, I touched on this slightly earlier but sort of trying to have them their cots on separate ends of the room with a machine in between it just helps um, to sort of reducing the chance of them waking each other and also you'll yeah. find they get to that point you know when they can stand up in their cots especially for nap time then they're having the time of their life if they can be right next to each other because it's yeah, yeah got another another human in there stimulating them whether it's one baby yeah. there's nothing going on so you go to sleep yeah yeah so, yeah is, is there um would well would you potentially separate them for naps but not for nights if you needed to like is there yeah. ever a cause for that like where okay we're going to do this for nap time because we're trying to work on one sleep the mm-hmm. other one needs to just go to sleep and that's fine but then at night time we're going to bring them back together is there you know yeah I think that's definitely beneficial sort of when you're trying to um sort of get those cot naps in and get them used to napping in their cot and extending those naps we certainly did that so we had one in our bedroom for nap time and one in our bedroom in the next to me cot um trying to because I found we tried putting them together and they just disturbed each other the whole time so we um did we probably did that for uh, maybe a couple of months had them napping in separate rooms um, mm. And then once the, you know, they've really got that skill of going to sleep, um, sort of napping for longer periods and everything, we put them back in the in the room together and yep. that worked fine. They Perfect. they would just, yeah, sort of go to sleep. But yeah, we separate. Yeah. Nighttime never really seemed to be an issue. They always, it's different, isn't it? Yeah. They were I think. Calm and, yeah. Because during the day, and you know, we know that nap training and, and getting babies to sleep well for naps can be difficult anyway even with just one and mm-hmm. it's, it is a different criteria you know we, we don't have the same um cues and signals that, that you know sleep time's coming or it's night time and it's harder to get the hang of and I think if you have got one that is more inclined to settle and sleep quite well for the nap mm-hmm. and one that does need a bit more help and support if we're not accommodating the one that could have that good sleep and they're then getting disturbed it's then going to impact on their ability to sleep well at night time and then you've got this vicious cycle whereas at least you know if you've got one well rested it's going to age the whole picture at night time and then you'll get there quicker so I think yeah I think that's actually quite and good I, for parents to recognize yeah and I think that's good to do early on sort of mm. um I've got uh, you know worked with some families where they're sort of much older and actually sort of when they're 18 months two years old separating them to try and work on that can actually be more 
uh, disturbing for them, sort of, that can disrupt them more than keeping them together. So mm. sort of, the more aware they are, the more difficult that can be. If they're always used to being in their room together, so they will, you know, why are you taking them out? And then not going to sleep because they want to know what the other one's doing. Um, so mm. I think, yeah, definitely early on, I think as they get older, that can make be more challenging if you're separating them for naps. But um, early on, that's, yeah, I'd say sort of under a year-ish, that um, can work really well. Amazing. Get those naps in and it will help the nights for sure. Yeah, definitely. So... What would you say then, like, I, I mean, we, we both know it's never too late. So if somebody is, you know, they're past the early stages and they haven't done this and they are finding themselves in a pickle now and they're like, okay, mm-hmm. I'm listening to this because I have twins and sleep is a mess and they don't know where to start. Um, you know, whether they're a year in, two, three years in, like, what would you say to um, a parent in that situation where they're like, I, I hear you and I know I need to get things on track. Where do I begin? Yeah. So I'd be looking at their sort of routine for their age. So looking at, um, you know, if you're wanting to work on naps, making sure you're settling them um, at the right sort of time of the day. So looking at what their um, age appropriate wake window is for settling for that nap um, and working what have I lost you? and working. Um, yeah, working through that. So sort of getting them down resettling them and yes the first sort of week or so might be really tough you might feel like you're not getting anywhere with it but keep going you know it will work and you will sort of get to that point where they're both comfortable going down together um and having that sleep together and like you said it's never too late there's so many things that you can work on um sort of getting those bedtime routines into place and making sure it's it's the right timing as well that they're not going to bed too late because that can cause um you know, a lot more sort of protest at bedtime, you, you know, if you're getting mm. earlier nights in, getting that right spot where they're, you know, they're tired um, and there's a lot more, a lot less resistance, I guess, to that bedtime. And just touching then on sort of more parenting aspects here, mm-hmm. when they are into toddlerhood, preschool age, and, you know, you can have those conversations, I guess this kind of goes for any siblings anyway, but particularly with twins where I imagine there can be some comparisonitis that happens and Mm -hmm. so on. Um, Is there anything that you would encourage around the language used? You know, we don't want to be saying things like, why can't you do what your brother does? Or, you know, he does this and you don't. We don't want to be sort of shaming or, or anything. But is there anything around that with twins you know young twins toddler twins preschool twins and Mm. how you can communicate to them so that they don't feel that you know either inferiority or competitiveness or jealousy Mm. um particularly towards sleep but generally really yeah I think exactly that not comparing so not saying you know well your brother sleeps why aren't you sleeping or look your brother's fast asleep why aren't you asleep and that's we've been very conscious of not doing that you know because they're two individuals they're gonna have different challenges at different stages in their lives Mm -hmm. so yeah not sort of not doing that comparison really and we're actually at a stage that my twins are four now and they will always ask sort of if you um even at dinner time one will say well how much did um Jacob eat I want to eat the same amount as Jacob so it's all that it's that constant they want to do exactly how the other one's doing you know I always try and say well it doesn't matter you need to eat until your tummy's full. It doesn't matter how much Jacob's eating because you might not be as hungry as him today or, mm. you know, trying to instill in that that they're their own person. They're not, they don't always have to be doing exactly the same as what their brother's doing or their twin's doing. Yeah. Um, and sleep time, again, not using that comparison. Um, sort of, I would always, um, my um, one that struggled a lot more with sleep, you know, I'd say it's really important you get your sleep because, you know, you want to do lots of playing tomorrow. You need to rest getting that sleep in is going to make you feel you know really happy and got lots of energy to play so explaining explaining why sleep is important because I think even from a young age I can understand that concept of needing rest to then you know have a really fun day the next day and even now um if we've got a late night planned or anything like that you know if we're going out in the evening we will say to them right let's go and have a sleep um and take notes says and they will happily have a seat you know if we say we're going to go out and do something really exciting tonight and you're going to be up a bit late so let's have a little sleep and you'll feel a lot happier and they'll happily go up and sort of they understand that concept 
Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Getting kids to value their sleep is so great. And I know that I mean, I, you know, I managed to do that with mine. And now at teen and preteen kind of age, they they do want their sleep. They wouldn't, um, you know, push to not have their sleep because they yeah. know that they feel rubbish when they don't have it. And, yeah. you know, just the, the experience of their day is not going to be as good if they are not well rested. So it's great. Um, to instill that positivity yeah. around it, I think. Definitely. Yeah, and that understanding. Because I think even from a young age, sort of two and a half, if it, they understand that, you know, they can they understand yeah. a lot more than what we think, I think, a lot of the time. And then they feel good. And I think to be able to reflect back to them, you know, you had such a great sleep and you, you know, and, and mm. then you'll do it, like you say, they piece together, oh, great sleep equals this fun experience. And yeah. I like this. And yeah, let's have more of that. It's, yeah, I think it's a yes, great way to get definitely. it. And I think it's get also it, of course, to them early on. Um, an impact on that. I, I'm fascinated by this. And I know having had two fairly close together, it's, you know, not twins, but quite close together. It's a whole different set of, um, of challenges. Mm. Yeah. And I think with their behavior as well, when you've got twins, especially in that like age two to three-ish you know that can be really challenging with behavior and when you've got two of them you know especially if you're going out and things like that if they're both you know at that stage where they're going to kick off about something and things like that that can be hard as a parent and it can be you know a bit I know a lot of twin mums who think I just I don't want to go out and face it because I can't deal with them both having a meltdown at the same time and how you actually cope with that and I think that all links in so well to sleep because, you know, the more sleep they have, the happier they are. If they're getting that rest during the day, sort of getting a good nap during the day, like their behaviour will be so much easier to handle and they will feel happy, you know, that they can regulate their emotions better. Sort of sleep is just, yeah, can really help with those sort of reducing those tantrums and those breakdowns because they're well rested, you know, they can handle their emotions a bit easier. Definitely. There was a slight glitch there, but I'll make sure that that's edited because I, okay. I lost you in the studio, but you're probably still recorded. So we'll, we'll get that edited. So don't worry. <laughs> I've made a note of when. Um, perfect. I'm just going to close that. Um, so, yeah, I I think this is so helpful. So, so helpful for parents who are expecting twins or um, have twins and are experiencing these challenges around sleep. Or maybe you're just curious and, and you know, you have twins and you think things are all right. But listening to this, you might see some room for even further improvement and mm. optimizing great sleep with your twins. Um, a twin mum once said to me, um, with my my two being 21 months apart and she said oh it's easier with twins she said because at least I've got them on the same same schedule mm. so if you are not a twin mum but like me have two quite close in age I feel you it's a juggle because they do have slightly different needs and you can end up going okay now it's nap time for one now it's nap time for the other mm. um, but that does pass and I always say like in enjoy it when things um the timings fit really well and know that when they they don't like when you have one on two naps and one on one nap and you're like there's constantly someone napping yeah. um that it's for such a short time um they grow up really quickly and before you know it, it you, you know you're past those challenging stages um and just to take the best care of your own sleep when you can around those difficult times as well yeah, definitely <laughs> Oh, Emily, it's been so, so great to talk to you about this today and hear about your own journey and juggle. Um, and, you know, you're here now doing such incredible work supporting families with sleep and twin parents as well. Um, if anybody has any questions for you or wants to reach out to you, what's, where's the best place for them to connect with you? Um, either on the Sleep Nanny website or... Uh... Yeah my instagram page um which is Amazing. sleep nanny emily simpson yeah so uh, either of those um you can reach us send me a, a direct message on instagram or yeah whichever's easier and um, go to the sleep nanny main page and you can see all the coaches there and i'm i'm listed there perfect you will find Emily there. Well, we will put the links as well in the show notes. So if anybody wants to drop you a message, go there, 
click it and you can get in touch and ask your questions. Well, once again, Emily, thanks so much for joining us today and we'll talk again soon. Brilliant. Thanks, Lucy. Hello, you back. Are you there now? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you hear me now?
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Not so fine. What's he doing? Go get him. I'll go up in a minute. Through the night, Bless him. I've not gone in there. But he's Stop just then for a minute. Yeah, but he's just sat there sucking his thumb thumbs. His really good. I yeah, I just looked at my face.
Hello. I thought it'd be easier to phone you. Um, so I know it's an app. So it, um, I followed the link that um, Becky sent me and it, uh, it prompted me to upload the app, download the app, sorry. Um, but yeah, so I've just been looking at my files on the iPad to see if I can find where it could have sent a file if it's completed it. Oh, I can't hear you now. Oh, you're on mute. That's that. I could see you talking on here. I was like, oh, but I can't see hear her on my thing. Um, what were you saying? Mm hmm Oh, it's the 99 has gone now anyway. Actually. Oh, no, it's moved on. Um, so when I click on that link that you sent me, it says if you used the mobile app, which I'm guessing will be the same as the iPad app, reopen it and keep the app open until the upload is finished. But I'm worried if I close it down and reopen it, then it might get lost. Be there. Mm. it's so strange because at my side it's completely not, like I can see everything clearly with you I can see and hear everything it's really odd well I can see me in the top right hand corner yeah Shall I come out of it? Shall I risk it? Yeah, I'll come out and reconnect. Right, let's see. 